Okay, so thank you everybody so much for coming. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Eitan Meir. I'm the head of uh, external relations and development for Intern2. I've definitely corresponded with a lot of you on uh, email, so it's nice to see the faces for the faces. Whoever wants to show their faces, that would be great. We'd love to see you. And uh, just a little before I hand the ball over to Matan and Doug, I just wanted to explain why we're actually, why we decided to do this. It's because since the election results came in a couple of weeks ago, we've really been bombarded with a lot of questions of people who really just want to know what's going on in Israel. It's very confusing now. Things are very unclear. No one really knows what's going on. Even I'm sure the prime minister and the heads of the parties don't really know what's going to be. So we decided to hold this Zoom and talk about, uh, you know, questions that we've received to hear from you guys, for here, to hear the Q&A. And uh, hopefully in three weeks, we're going to have another Zoom. Once we know more things, what happened within the political realm, we're going to have another Zoom to talk about what happened. And uh, before I get into the three questions that I'm going to pose to Matan and Doug, we're going to speak about it for a little bit. And then we're going to open it up to Q&A. While you guys, while they're talking, feel free to send questions to the chat. And then after they're done discussing the initial few questions, I'm going to go ahead and read out the questions as they came in on the chat. And then we'll be able to have a, a little talk about that. So the three main questions that we received they pretty much all boil down to this. The first one is really simple. What in the world is going on? Israel, for whoever doesn't know the political uh, situation here, it's very, very confusing. A parliament, this coalition, that coalition, what does it all mean? Where are we standing now? And the second the question that we got a lot is, what's the deal with Ram? Ram is this Islamist party, this Arab party that people are talking about forming a coalition with, whether it be a right-wing coalition with it or a left-wing coalition. So we're going to talk a little about Ram, who they are, what they believe in, and what the implications could be of them joining a potential coalition. And the third question is, what does Inter2 think about it? What's our stance? As one of the leading Zionist organizations in Israel, what do we think about all the things that are going on, particularly Ram and uh, entertaining a government with them in it? So now I'm going to go ahead and pass the ball over to our distinguished uh, CEO, Matan Pelig, and chairman of the board, uh, Doug Altabeth, to uh, really start by answering these three questions that I just presented. Okay, thank you, Eitan. I'm going to start. Um, we're working our way up to the best guy. Um, and uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, Shavua Tov to everyone. It's really wonderful to see all of you. As Eitan said, uh, we felt it was important, uh, given the volume of calls that we have gotten, questions that we've received, but also because we we miss you, frankly. We miss seeing our many of our friends and this is not perfect but you know this has been a time where we've had to make uh, a lot of adjustments um, before we get started i want to give you just a very quick update about imtutsu itself uh, you know many of you have heard us say that we refer to imtutsu as the largest grassroots zionist organization in israel and we base that both on objective criteria, such as having the largest Facebook page of any NGO in Israel, and uh, more anecdotal criteria, such as the thousands of media mentions that we get every year, and our ability to inspire legislation, caucuses in the Knesset, when we in fact have a function, functioning government. Um, so, that doesn't mean we have not been uh, affected by the virus. We have been very much affected by the virus. But I'm proud to say that we have effectively, uh, I think, made lemonade out of lemons, meaning that I think we have reached, uh, met the challenge, and, and we've done so in a way that has worked uh, for the circumstances. Let me give you one example. We have an initiative that many of you have heard of called the Seminars for Zionist Thought, uh, which the Jerusalem Post referred to as the largest academic extracurricular activity in Israel, uh, in which on a bi-weekly basis, we give free lectures by A-list speakers on a variety of topics at five of the leading campuses in Israel. And over the course of a year, tens of thousands of people would attend these lectures. Well, guess what? They haven't happened for over a year. But what we decided to do was to utilize a studio, take the lectures, put them, uh, make them virtual, digitize them as it were, and add to lectures, interviews, and panels 
And from tens of thousands of views we have of, of attendees, we have had literally many hundreds of thousands, upwards of a million views. So I think that's a, a great example of adapting to a difficult situation. In fact, we've been so gratified by the results that we have decided to create our own dedicated studio in our offices in Jerusalem. We've carved out a small space uh, in our offices for this purpose. Any of you who have visited our offices in Jerusalem know we don't have a heck of a lot of space for carving out anything, but this has been a priority. So uh, our little Zionist salon, as we call it, will go live in, a, in hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Uh, all of these good things, frankly, I credit to our leadership, particularly to my conversant today, to Matan Peleg, our CEO, and to his team. And Matan has overseen a culture of incredible dedication and commitment. We have kept our team intact. And I'm really, you know, I, I'm, I'm an older guy, as they say, but I am so optimistic about the future of Israel based on what I see going on with the young people who make Inchitsu happen. So uh, one of Matan's many talents is he has a tremendously acute antennae about what's happening in Israel politically, what happens in the halls of power here. And I think you will hear from him uh, at a minimum some intriguing observations about the questions that Eitan has posed. So with that, let's get started. Matan, I would ask you, look, uh, let's start with a little bit of background. This is our fourth election in less than two years. It, we are starting to resemble post-war Italy. Um, and, uh, but Manishtana, you know, these elections have been a little bit different from one another or are they the same? Give us a little bit of context for this election compared to the ones that preceded it. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm also very excited to have a Zoom meeting that is international. I, I see people from uh, Europe, uh, United States, and uh, Canada, and this is amazing. I'm very uh, thrilled. Um, about uh, your question, I think, I think this, this last round, that is the fourth one, things uh, were clarified that it, this is, um, but from the, it was clarified, but from the other side, it didn't. What do I mean? At the first and the second and the third round, it was left against right, basically. And uh, this time it is very obvious that it is all about um, a, a parties who hate uh, B B Benjamin Netanyahu and parties who support him. Um, because in the left side, there are two parties um, that are considered to be more to the right, but um, hate Bibi. So from one side, you can say that this uh, round is uh, only about Bibi, but from the other side, um, if the, call, if the, the Bibi haters will create a government, in, it looks like they also don't have a chance. The other side also doesn't have a chance. But um, it, so it's not about left and right. It's about BB, anti-BB and pro-BB, anti-BB, pro-BB. But from the other side, the anti-BB side is more leftist. It's, and the right side, it's more to the right. So it's all about a Jewish connection. So from one side, it's a mix between left and right, because it's all about Bibi. But from the other side, it's still obvious that if the anti-Bibi coalition will uh, um, create a government, it will be a left government. Okay. But that... Eitan, can you share the, the, uh, the bar chart with us so that we, our, yeah. our friends can see exactly yeah, who got what happened? If, okay. if I can uh, show... Sorry, one second. Yeah. Can you show the pie first? Sorry, Doug. Because the pie, look at the pie. For, the pie okay. showed what, what I just said. The pie is the results 
of the last election, okay? And uh, can you explain, Eitan, maybe with your English, can you explain a little bit what are we seeing here, the 50, the numbers? Of course, it's really, it's really a simple breakdown of the election results. As you see here, the pro-BB camp has 52 seats currently. And the pro-BB camp are the, all the parties that basically said, we're going to sit with BB as the prime minister. The anti-BB camp, which is including the joint Arab list, which is important to note, they have 57 seats. And they, of course, said they will not sit under BB. The two big question marks is, uh, are your Mina and Ram? And I think, uh, Doug, you want to go ahead and just explain a little bit about them and why they're the question marks? And we'll... but, before, right. but, before, but before you jump... Uh, yeah, it, no, no, I, yeah, right. Important also to say that the majority in the Knesset if, is for the right. If they right. did it, they will separate emotions and emotional feelings and emotional hatred to one each other and just look at it objectively, the right have more mandates. The right... I think, that, I think that's the key point, Matan. You made a very interesting observation that it's a dual track situation here where you have on the one hand a pro-BB, anti-BB split. On the other hand, you have a left-right split. But look at the yellow, the, the lower left number, the 72. That's what you're referring to. So you have 72 mandates, which is 60%, exactly 60% of the Knesset would fall into what we're calling a religious right-wing party. Now, the difficulty here is that while you would normally assume that they would uh, gravitate to one another, right? Uh, they're not doing that because of the feelings about the prime minister. So what we have here in the purple are two parties, Yamina, which is Naftali Bennett's party, the right wing party as it's called, and Ram, which is one of the Arab parties. Now, just by way of background, there has been this thing called the joint list, which are a consolidation of about four Arab parties that they have all run together. In this election, Ram split off from the joint list uh, and ran separately. In the previous election, the joint list got something like, correct me guys, 14 or 15 mandates and yet in this election, the two together only got 10, four for Ram and six for the joint list. So a, a significantly lower uh, representation for the total of the Arab parties, but Ram and, and Bennett's Yamina are emerging as something of uh, swing votes, uh, kingmakers has been a term that's been used uh, but as Matan points out, the real, the real differentiation here is that uh, normally ideologically aligned parties, uh, religious or right-wing parties, are not aligned. And so when Matan says, you know, it's, this, is a, this election is different because it's right versus right, that is where you see Yisrael Bitena, which is a Victor Lieberman's party, uh, the New Hope party, which is Gidon Sar's party, uh, have specifically said they will not sit in a government. This is what they're saying right now, anyhow. They will not sit in a government with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. So uh, that, is, uh, that is sort of the background. Now, Matan, let's walk through what, looking at it from the prime minister's point of view, because remember he gets, Likud got 30 mandates. President Rivlin a few days ago gave, uh, Likud gave the prime minister the first shot at putting together a government. He has about 28 days to do that. So we have about three weeks or so left in that, in that effort. Uh, what what are the possibilities that are available to the prime minister? Can you look for a, for a second to the other slide? Yes. Here it's a, just all what Doug said, but really numbers. Here it is really easy to see uh, the game because I know that some some of the people very hard for them to understand. 
the game. The game is who get to 61. 61 is the majority. And then you can uh, form a government. Theoretically, you can, um, you don't have to go to 61, you can get to 59, and, uh, and a, a party that is not inside the government still support you from outside. And like this, you create a majority. The thing is, by the way, that I, the problem is when you look at the numbers and you start to play the game, not, there is no side that can create um, create a 61. This is the main problem. Gidon Saar, the New Hope, have six. And, and, and you know what, let's, let's play the game from, from the beginning. Likud have 30, and he will be with Shas, it's 39. He will be with, um, uh, with United Torah Judaism, and he will be with the Religious Zionist Party. Those are the automatically ones. Now he needs to play the game. Maybe Yamina, and that's it. All the rest are the anti-BB side. And then you have the one in the middle, it's, the, it's uh, Ram. Ram will be the next um, discussion that we will have, and it is a very important discussion, but um, now I, there is no chance that one of the problem is that if the, the, the Netanyahu, the Likud um, group, forgetting to get 61, they need or to work with Ram, the Islamic movement, or to bring from other parties, um, Ethan, how do you say Arikim, people who leave their parties and cross the line? Deserters, yeah, <laughs> deserters, to, to poach people from other parties and get them. Right. Um, but, right. but, but as we see it now, it is not possible. We don't see any option. If it was an option, let's, let's say the Team Tirzu, we will be very, very surprised because we have very good friends in the Likud, very good friends in New Hope, very good friends in Yamina, and very good friends with the Bezalel Smotrich, that is the religious Zionist party. We have very good friends in every party, so we, our ears are very open. People are approaching to us a lot. And so it's very hard also to go, uh, you know, uh, between the drops and, and still be, you know, in the middle of this uh, storm and we don't see, we don't see any, any solution for now. So Matan, now that you were saying that there doesn't seem to be such a good solution and it seems like one of the Likud's only options is to get the Ram party in its coalition or to have it not oppose it. Do you explain a little bit what is this Ram party? Because people don't really seem to understand. They think it's just another Arab, Israeli Arab party, but it's a little, it goes a little deeper than that. Right. And Eitan, put the, the pie chart back up because that visually tells the story of, of where we are. Um, right. and, and yeah, so, so Matan, that's a great question of, uh, about Ram. Why don't you give us an introduction to Ram? Okay, I will, I will give an introduction to Ram and then you, Doug, maybe with, with your better English, will uh, explain a little bit more and then we will talk about uh, the, the, the problem and the atmosphere that is, uh, and the debate there is in the right camp about Ram. So basically, Ram is the Islamic movement. The Islamic movement that is a, a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, okay? Um, in the Islamic movement in Israel, like in other places in the Middle East, the Islamic movement in Israel also separated for two different branches. One is, um, the Northern Branch, the Islamic Movement, the Northern Branch, and the Islamic Movement, the Southern Branch. The difference between them is the North, the North Branch um, doesn't believe in cooperate with Israel, with Israel institutions, okay? Of course, they go to take the Bituach Lumi and, uh, all, and all the things that, uh, because they are still citizens of Israel, but they don't cooperate, they don't go to elections, they ban the, 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 the elections. This is the North Branch. The Southern Branch 
of the Islamic movement, uh, is considered to be more moderate, but it's only because people don't read Arabic, so they less understand. It doesn't, the, the fact that the, the southern branch go and um, take part in the election um, game, it doesn't mean that they are more moderate. At the end of the day, both of them are Islamic movement. Both of them, after, a, a lot of time after terror attacks, went to visit the family, the families of people who killed Jews, killed Israelis. A lot of time they come to um, uh, visit uh, terrorists after they uh, made the time in jail. So they are, and, and every one of them, it's an, and, and again, it's the Islamic movement. So both of them believe in, uh, that Israel doesn't have a right uh, to exist as a Jewish state, okay? Because this is by their religion, um, um, a holy ground of Isl Islamic holy ground, and there is no right to any country, to any other state to be except an Islamic state. This is Ram. Um, the I think though, Matan, it's important to, to ask the question, why all of a sudden is Ram a factor? Uh, and again, as I mentioned previously, the Arab parties had all run together. In this election, Ram decided to stick a finger in the eye of the other parties, split off, and run separately. What was that based on? It was based on the idea that they were willing to cooperate, they were willing to uh, play ball with uh, the, uh, presumably with the, uh, the Prime Minister's party, that they would be willing to have discussions and have greater integration. That, that has been, that sort of little opening of the door has been something that has made a lot of people uh, very excited about the possibility of working with Ram, including the prime minister who is, uh, you know, has not dismissed that possibility. Uh, but it's important to remember really who who you're dealing with. Ram has not said, okay, fine, we will, uh, we're happy to accept a Jewish state. Okay, fine, we're not uh, upset about the nation state law which codifies uh, Israel as a Jewish state. Okay, fine, uh, we, we, are, we accept the pillars of our society. We're actually, we're going to encourage our young people to do national service and integrate into society. That has been the hope. And, and by the way, there are grassroots Arab groups uh, that will say that, will believe that. And in fact, Imjirtsu supports those groups. We honor those groups who, who throw their lot in with the state of Israel who want to integrate into Israel. But, but Ram has not taken that step at all. So uh, we're, you know, there in the Bronx where I come from, there's the expression to drink someone pretty. You know, that's what we're doing with Ram a little bit. We're deciding that they are really more part of the program than they would certainly indicate to their own people. And, and so uh, we're a little bit ahead of ourselves in reality in terms of where they are. Now, unfortunately, because of the compelling math that you see on this pie chart, Prime Minister doesn't have that many options to get to 61. He can try to lure, as Matan said, uh, a couple of people from the other parties, and right now that doesn't seem to be feasible, or he can try to reach some kind of a, an accommodation. And Matan said it could be inside the coalition or it could be outside the formal coalition with, with Rom, where they said, look, we won't be part of the government, but you have our commitment, we will vote for uh, initiatives proposed by the government. There are so, no. Sorry? 
No, no, please. No, so that's why Ram is is stage center right now. That's why they're getting so much attention. There are also a few points that uh, are important to to say based on the things that you said that are also very important for this discussion. First of all, we must ask ourselves the first question, how Ram uh, became a, a potential partner? What exactly happened? And here, I think um, we can take the Abraham Accords as an example. In the Abraham Accords, the joint list voted against the, 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 the peace uh, treaties, they were against the Abraham Accords, okay? The Islamic movement, Israel, the joint list, all the uh, Arab uh, parties in Israel, they were against the peace. The, the Arab, the Arab um, um, people in Israel were very surprised that the, 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 the Arab parties in Israel were against the peace, why? Because the peace with the Emirates and the peace in the Middle East create a lot of um, opportunities to the Arabs in Israel to, to you know, open, open the world for them. The Arab businessmen, now they have a good potential to thrive, to make more money. The Arabs in Israel were always, they had always the dream to go to more Arab countries without um, have the problem to come back to Israel. Now there is peace, they can go with no problem. So for them, the, the Arab society in Israel, they saw it as an opportunity. The Arab lists, the, they, they were against it. Then Ram, Ram party, uh, although they voted against the, the, the Abraham Accords when they were together, Mansour Abbas, the head of the Islamic movement, the head of Ram, he saw it as an opportunity. He un understood the anger and the frustration of the Arabs in Israel. So on the campaign, the, the last campaign that he did was all about, um, let's, let's forget for a second about the Palestinian hood and about the, um, to resist Israel and let's face, and let's cooperate with Israel because what is important now is to fight our challenges, because uh, I'm sure that if you follow the news in Israel, you see that they her, they, there are a lot of uh, um, murderers, a lot of violence in, this, in the Arab society in Israel. The Arab society in Israel today, it's like a citizen, citizen war between the one each other. It's like so the Wild can, West. Right. What? It's like the Wild West. Yes. There's tremendous amounts of intra-Arab violence. And, and the need for greater security. And when people, and even, even people from the right, when they saw this campaign, a lot, of, a lot of Israelis, you know what, left and right, they saw the Islamic movement campaign and they were impressed. This is, something, this is also the Zionist dream, right? To find a solution with our neighbors, not always war. So a lot of people, including myself, a lot of people, appreciate it in also so i think also by the way to solve a lot of arab society problems in israel we need partners in iran although the islamic movement we can use it to solve some of the problems but to create a government who is dependent dependent of the islamic movement and we have in, in imtirzu a lot of connections with a lot of arabs who, who joined the army, who are doing civil service. And, and they also said, they say in the Middle East, everybody will see that the Jewish state, the, all the, polit the political spectrum in Israel the, as a Jewish state is now depending on the Islamic movement. This is what is, it's, um, it's, it's something that is against the integration in the, on, the, on the far, um, you know, on the long distance, this is, will create less and less integration because the Islamic movement is not about integration. Um, again, it's a party that is against the existing of Israel as a Jewish democratic state. Um, 
So here's, here's, the, here's the real conundrum. What you're saying, what we're both saying is that a lot of Israeli society would love to work with an Arab party that was truly integrated, uh, truly interested in, in integration, that says, look, we need help. We want to be at the table with you, but we have problems in our communities. We need more uh, police. We need more housing. We need better infrastructure. Help us out. And, and there's great sympathy, uh, even maybe even especially on the right, for doing that. Because as Matan said, it's part and parcel of the Zionist agenda, the Zionist dream. The problem is that that's not who you're dealing with, with Ram. That's, that is as much as we would like to look at the aspects of them that are sort of inclined towards integration, you know, when they're talking to their own people, they're not saying the kind of things that give us comfort. It's no different really in many respects from the way the Palestinians accord themselves. They'll say what they have to say for the Western media, and then they'll talk to their own people in a way that is very, very different, much more rejectionist, much less accommodationist. So here's the real problem. If the prime minister in the name of getting to 61 opens the door to working with a party like this, he has opened that door for all time, effectively. He will have done something that will make sure that when, if the left has an opportunity to create a government, they will not have a qualm in the world about reaching out to not just to Rom, but to any Arab parties, because they'll say, hey, you guys did it. You did it first. You, you were willing to work with these guys. Why shouldn't we? And that is a very, to my way of thinking, that's a very powerful argument. It is you lose your standing to say this you know, is off limits, because you, you, meaning the right, will have taken them in ourselves. So it, it becomes very, very problematic. As much as we would like to work with integrated uh, Arab sector of the, uh, uh, of the society, I don't think that Ram represents that. Do you, do you disagree, Matan? I don't think so, but do you no, disagree? I think uh, you said it right. This is, this is the obvious thing. At the end of the day, um, Tertzu, by the way, as a Zionist movement, as an ideologic movement, one of the things that uh, we must do in this time is to explain to people the risk of to be depending on, this, uh, on, on, on the Islamic movement. That is absurd. This is unbelievable. Let's not forget it. In the beginning of the discussion, we said that there is a, the vast majority in the Knesset are for the right. If they would take the, their emotional feelings to the side and take responsibility, um, would they will create a, a right-wing government in Israel, and that's it. So it's, it's, as we see it, all the leaders, by the way, are behaving in a childish way and uh, forcing us to think about to, be, to create a government that it depends on the Islamic movement. That's my, let's not forget, it, uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood are not legal in uh, Egypt and in Jordan and in, in, in Saudi Arabia. And all those, all our neighbors are looking. Mm -hmm. they, they, they are like, they, they are, they are crazy. Um, so Matan, uh, I want to. So you pretty much you clarified into two steps. Yeah. Uh, we're very much uh, against Ram. And I just want to uh, move on to questions. A small technical question. Someone asked, "What does it mean of Ram being a part of the government from the outside? What does it mean exactly that they're not in?" the coalition of 61, but they're not against it from the outside. What, how exactly does that work? So basically, even if they are not in the government, uh, they still prevent of the other side to have a majority on everything, okay? But, um, but from the other side also, the government does, it cannot do things that are, um, let's say that now there is a, a war in Lebanon. Okay, or a big operation in Gaza. 
and the Islamic movement will tell you, um, no, you cannot do any operation, then, and they can say, and if you will do an operation against Hamas, I will, um, uh, then the government will fall. This is, this is the meaning of being depend on the uh, Ram. Uh, by the way, um, the, the, the Likud supporters, the Bibi, the Netanyahu supporters, who still think a government with Ram is better than um, a fifth election, they are saying they want only money and they will not, how do you say it, to, to milk, to like, uh, to milk something. Extortion, right? Not extort, yeah, it's awful. <laughs> yeah, they won't extort. They, they want, they want, you know, like Tammany Hall. They want uh, to uh, get money for their communities, but they don't want to disrupt the society. That's yeah. what, that's what they'd like to believe. But I, I see that they also in the chat that there are a lot of conversations. That let's, let's give it a try to open it and because uh, I'm sure most of the questions are about the conversation, so I don't mind to, to... Yes, so I've been writing down, there's a lot of questions, and again, I apologize in advance if we don't touch upon every little point. I'm gonna try to do it as best as I can to pose the questions to Matan and Doug as they came in. So I first wanna talk uh, to uh, ask a question that came from Goldie and from Moshe Weinberg. I'm apolo apologies if I, don't, uh, if I didn't pronounce that correctly. The basic question is, what exactly motivates the anti-Bibi faction? So the point that they are risking forming a left-wing government rather than join Bibi, especially now that there's the Iranian threat, there's the Biden administration, which is not, gonna, not too friendly towards Israel. So what, what motivates them? How come these people are willing to sit with a left-wing as opposed to forming a wide right-wing government? What is it about Bibi that they don't like? Doug, you want to start? No, I'd like to hear what you have to say. Because you you know you know some of these personalities, so you know what their uh, where their animosity is coming from. This is um, the question: why, why why the BB anti an anti BB camp is really hate him? You can divide it because the left hates BB since the beginning of his career. Let's not forget, BB was elected after the Oslo Accords. So Bibi is the Antichrist, okay? Rabin was the angel, he was Christ. He was supposed to bring, you know, God, peace, and it, did, it didn't work. So the left blame Netanyahu, okay? The left blame Netanyahu for, not, for, not, for Oslo, for Rabin, uh, for killing the dream. Now, this is the left. In the right, it is, it is, I think it is really a lot about um, feelings. At the end of the day, we're people, uh, you know, people have feelings. And so this is a lot about self-hatred. Um, uh, and now about the society, uh, about the, the people on the right that are against BB, there are basically two reasons. One, there are a lot of people who say that Netanyahu is not right enough. I know a lot of people that voted for Gidon Saar, and they say BB is not right wing enough. So it's better to bring, to, to go to someone else. Also, let's, and another thing of people who are getting tired of Netanyahu, got tired of Netanyahu, Let's not forget, we are living in a, in a democratic society. In democratic society, you are educated from the age of zero that once in a while you have to change your prime minister. You're doing it in election. This is like the weather. It's something that is happening. This is the natural flow. So from one side, Bibi is a good leader and brought a, an amazing results for Israel. But from the other side, he's supposed to go. I don't know why, but this is, I was educated that once in a while you change a prime minister. There are not a lot of people like this. Still, Netanyahu is very popular. But, uh, but, but again, but think about what I said in mathematics. The left is against him. 
the, and with the time, more people from the right also getting tired from him. And also with the time, with round after round, there are people who just get tired of going to the, to elect, to, to the election again and again. So they don't go to vote. So left, plus right that hates Bibi, plus people that are pro-Bibi, but they don't go to vote. It's uh, like this, you're getting to a tie. It's still amazing that, by the way, that it's still on a tie and not a knockout against Netanyahu. It shows that still a lot of people are really supporting. By the way, I can understand why. I have a, a WhatsApp group with people that I was with them in the army, in, in the first year of the army. And one of them is, is in Florida. And he still didn't get the injection of, of the COVID-19. And he said as a joke, yeah, I know in Israel, you started to vaccine also your animals, your dogs, your puppies. <laughs> so he's very frustrated. Right. So we're living in an amazing time. Bibi is still really, you can appreciate him very much. But from yeah. the other side, it's not enough. But if we will go with Ram, we will see it in him too, like he crossed the line. Yeah. Let's talk about for a minute, is there, some people have said, uh, is there a path for, for Lapid to create a government? Is there a path for Bennett to create a government or even Saar? What do you think of those possibilities? Is that, is that something that's feasible? So there are people who ask this question and because we are in Tirzu and we are a lot of um, influential people in influential people in the, in the political spectrum are trying to convince us to take part. A lot of people are trying to convince us, for example, to criticize Naftali Bennett very hard. And like this, to prevent a future potential of Bennett to create a, a, a government that is depending on the Arab list or Ram. Again, we are against the Arab list and against Ram, not because they are Arabs, but because they are anti-Zionist and they don't think Israel need to exist as a Jewish state. But we are saying to all of them, we will not criticize Naftali Bennett about it because there is, we don't see, maybe we will be surprised, but for now, we don't see a reason, we don't see a chance that Naftali Bennett will create a move, a, a government that he will be depend on terrorist supporters. Why? Why? Because a, a lot of bereaved families, a lot of bereaved families, also groups that we help in Im Tirzu, they did it on their own. They didn't even ask us. But a lot of them supported Naftali Bennett. I think theoretically those bereaved families who daughters and, and sons were murdered by terrorists, if Naftali Bennett will go with the Arab list with terror supporters, they will demonstrate so hardly against him. And Naftali Bennett knows it. He doesn't, I don't think he has the courage to have this kind of groups demonstrate 24 hours a day outside his home. Theoretically, and, and, and you know, going back to that pie chart, theoretically, if uh, Lapid uh, who got the most mandates other than Bibi, uh, were to take in Bennett and to take in Saar and, uh, and Yisrael Bitano and both of the Arab groups, he would have 61. He could mathematically put together a coalition. But as Matan said, the likelihood of either Saar and particularly Bennett sitting with the, uh, with the government that, you know, we, we said, how could you be dependent on Ram? How could you be dependent on Ram and the Arab list, the joint list, uh, I think would be a bridge too far for Bennett, probably a bridge too far for Saar as well. I think Bennett would see that his pretense to being, you know, head of the Yamina party would be somewhat hypocritical if he were to sit with uh, that kind of a government. But, but again, theoretically, mathematically, it is a possibility and it can't be uh, completely discounted because, you know, 
politics is the art of, uh, of the possible and, uh, and, and of strange bedfellows. Uh, but but it's uh, uh, not a really low chance. Yeah, very low chance. I, I would agree. Eitan, do you want to take more questions? questions? There seem like there are a lot yeah. of questions. Um, exactly. There are a lot of questions. We'll try to get to all of them. I'm going to group two questions together. Uh, one from Eric Pastman and the other from Anthony Luder. Eric writes how in 2009, Lieberman resigned from the Knesset in order to fight charges against him. He was acquitted and then he returned to the government. Uh, Eric asked, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't Netanyahu try to do the same thing? And Anthony ag adds, which is sort of, a, I guess, the same sort of question. He's sort of saying, it seems like Bibi is willing to sit with whoever to keep power, whether it's the far right or the far left Arab parties. So what's your take on why Bibi is so, I guess, hell bent on staying in power? Is it just because he deserves to be there? Is it for some other reason? How do you view this take? As I, um, I, I will take the first uh, uh, try to, to answer it. Since the Netanyahu first time as a prime minister, it's like in the last, I will say it differently, in the last 25 years, Netanyahu was investigated 19 times, okay? 25 years, 19 times, okay? Every time he went out with it, uh, white as snow. He was totally kosher. And also now he say, all those things, all those investigations are just the same as the, uh, the things that I had before. It's nothing. I will go with this uh, completely uh, kosher and everything is okay. He's saying it uh, in self-confidence and I think, and again, he said it on himself, um, 19 times it, it already happening. This time, uh, this fishing really created um, a situation that it's, it's the first time that they went to court. But those investigations, again, was so much times in the last 25 years. Now, so the first, I think Netanyahu said, this is what he tell himself. Another thing, he said, look, uh, I'm very popular. Why do I need, why do I need to take, take you know, to take my arms up like this and uh, to surrender because the deep state is trying to fishing against me. Why? This is this is a coup. I was I was um, elected by by the people. I Bibi doesn't have a power. Let's not forget Bibi doesn't have any power. He's nothing. He's nothing. He all the power that he gets, all the political power that he gets, it's from the people. The people vote for him. That's the only reason he's a, he's the prime minister. He's doing all the efforts that he does. It's for getting elected again and again. People appreciate his uh, achievements. So I think when he, he combined those two, he say, I, I don't want to surrender. And, um, and the law in Israel, by the way, as a minister, if there are charges against you, uh, you need to quit. By the way, the law was changed, but still maybe the uh, Bagats, the, the prime, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court is still will be against him. But you can be theoretically a prime minister also if you are in court. So um, it's still very strong. I think all the left is very surprised that uh, he didn't you know, surrender and that's it. But he believes in his, uh, um, 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 you know, his cleanness, his kosher. And um, so he doesn't want to surrender. In the, I think in a way, this, I think, uh, I can, I can, personally, I can understand it. Maybe I cannot justify it in a way, but basically I can, I can understand it and I can appreciate it. What can I say? Eitan, what was the second Anthony's question? A moment. Why it doesn't he go? More like a, it was more of a statement saying that Bibi is willing to, it seems, uh, according to- uh, Anthony, to, to make a deal with the devil, so to speak. Exactly. So well, we're well, that's the question. Uh, that, that really is the question. What, how far will he go to, to uh, see himself uh, put a coalition together? From our point of view, from Mintir Tzu's point of view, uh, 
you know, we say have at it, but do not touch the third rail that is Ram, okay? In other words, try to convince people in New Hope, try to convince people in Blue and White uh, to come over. Maybe you can do something more informal with some of those people, but, but we don't want that uh, arrangement to include something with, uh, with Ram. So on the topic of, I want, I want to ask a question from Sam Solomon. It's an interesting question. Yes, how is Ram a different ideologically? How are they different ideologically from the Haredi parties? Sam says that they're using the Haredi playbook. They don't accept the state. They only consider local politics and they're willing to sit with anyone to get in their way. Uh, okay, well, I think Sam is half right. Um, I think that certainly socially, the, the Ram and the Haredim, you know, uh, probably have a lot more in common than than either of them do with secular people of their respective faiths. Uh, I, I think though that, you know, my Haredim friends would say, no, Haredim accept the state of Israel. We are actually Zionists, not all, but most are Zionists, certainly are not opposing the, the Jewish, uh, the nation state law, which is a big line of divide between uh, the Haredim and the Ram party. Um, and uh, so I think that, that uh, while there are a lot of uh, social uh, similarities, I do think it breaks down at the doorstep of acceptance of a Jewish state. And also uh, the Haredic parties, uh, leaders and voters never uh, visited terrorists' uh, home. It, to support terror was never uh, in their agenda. And, uh, and the Islamic movement leaders, uh, let's not forget, we in Hebrew and in English, we are saying the southern branch of the Islamic movement the, in Israel. They are calling themselves uh, the southern branch of the Islamic movement in internal Palestine, in, in Palestine, in, in Palestine. They don't even say Israel. They, so they support terror, the Haredic party doesn't. The, the, the Haredic say Israel, they want a Jewish uh, identity in Israel, they don't, okay? Even, even the most moderate speech that Ram did ever in Hebrew, it was, uh, it, it was, last, it was less than two weeks ago, and it was supposed to like convince the Israelis that it's a moderate uh, party. At the end of the day, all the, the flags behind were Islamic movement flags that Hamas use and not Israeli flag at all. So there is a, there is a difference. Um, uh, Matan, I want to just ask a question on this point that I got from, from Shachar Golan. He's asking if you could clarify that notion of a Jewish state. You've been talking a lot about how Ram is not willing to accept a Jewish state. What, is it, what does exactly mean a Jewish state? Does that mean only Jews can live in it? Does that mean it's going to be a religious state? What exactly does a Jewish and democratic state mean? Um, I will, I will say, I, I will uh, let's let's talk about Ram. Okay, in the now they they had a list of demands. What they want to um, to if if this what they they will pay to the to Ram, they will join the government, cooperate with any kind of government. They want to change. The, the Jewish national uh, basic law. Basic law, you said in English? Okay, yes. so? Yes. so they, nation state law. Yes. The nation state law. So there are 14, one for 14 um, uh, basic laws in Israel. 13 of them, it's about the democratic identity of the state. Only one, one is a basic law that is about the Jewish character of Israel. They said, we will go in if you will change the, the, the nation state uh, law. Two, they want also to um, give Hechsher to all the Arab um, illegal um, buildings in the Negev and in, uh, in the Galil and, all, uh, and in uh, other places in Israel. So, Israel as a Jewish democratic state, we want to leave it as it now. 
and all, but, but they are against all laws that are um, supposed to defend it. Okay, but let's, let, to, to your question or to Shachar's question, uh, Eitan, a Jewish state enshrines Judaism as the state religion, as the official religion of the state. Now, that doesn't mean that non-Jews don't have full rights, doesn't mean the non-Jews can't live here. There are 30 plus uh, countries in the world where Islam is the official religion. There are 20 plus countries in the world where Christianity is the official religion. There is one country in the world here, Israel, where Judaism is the official religion. Our calendar works according to the Jewish calendar. Hebrew is the language uh, the official language of Israel, although Arabic and uh, has a special uh, place as well, and uh, to a lesser extent, English has some place. But these are distinctions that are created that are meant to enshrine Judaism without denigrating, without derogating the rights of non-Jew. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I want to tied another question here I got for Meron Brannick from Germany. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, he writes that Israel, Israel has been a beacon of light for the LGBTQ community in the Middle East. Do you think that's going to be threatened if Ram enters the coalition? And just to really expound upon that, meaning theoretically, if there's Ram and the Haredi parties in the Knesset who are very conservative in terms of you know, their religious views, could that have any that have any uh, manifestation in legislation? Do you think they would work together to make things, to address laws or enforce all these uh, laws that might be seen as uh, oppressive in the West? If, if I was a leftist, I would say yes, for sure. Now they're going to persecute gays in the streets. But um, because I'm a little bit more realistic, I know that the, the dynamic in this, no, they, first of all, there is not any law that uh, there is a chance that uh, will cross, in my opinion, against the LGBT society. And also, if it was a law like this, it will never go through because the, no one in the society, in the, in the general society, will uh, cooperate with this. This is not a chance. Because it, theoretically, you can form a government and you create bills, but um, the dynamic of the society is the... Uh, and, and the norms of the society are sometimes much, much stronger than uh, any law that you will um, uh, legislate it. And also um, with, the no, in, with no cooperation of the society with any law, things will never go, go through. So um, I don't think there is a chance, okay. not theoretically, not not Masa. Okay, okay, I want to pivot now to David from Toronto, who basically asked a simple question. Let's say Netanyahu is gone. Who is in line to, to take over the Likud leadership? And does that person have a better chance of keeping the right in power? Meaning if Bibi theoretically would be gone tomorrow, who would be, or which of members of the Likud might switch in? And would they have a better chance of forming a wide right-wing government? Or does Netanyahu still have the best chance? Um... There are some uh, people in the Likud, of course, that are uh, potential leaders. Nir Barkat, that uh, I th I'm sure people uh, heard the name a lot. He was the mayor of Jerusalem. Yuli Edelstein is also very popular. He was uh, a Zionist prisoner in, uh, in Russia. He was the head of the coalition, or head of the Knesset. He's today the, the most popular uh, Knesset member in the Likud after Netanyahu. There are some potential leaders. If theoretically, if theoretically, um, um, Netanyahu will go out of the game, and then, um, so for, for a while, it, yeah, it, it can create a, a government. The left will hate the other guy also, and the obsessiveness against the right uh, national camp, no matter what, they will always be against him. Now it's Bibi, tomorrow it's someone else. But, um, the, but the, the, naturally, when Netanyahu will go and, um, 
and there is, it will be, a, um, it will be a, a, a very strong competition. Let's not forget when Shamir, Yitzhak Shamir was the leader of the Likud, still it, they, they, call it, they, they called it the Idana Nesichim, the age, the age of a prince, of prince. Everyone saw himself as a, a, the next king in the Likud. So there were a lot of fights. So even uh, Shamir, Yitzhak Shamir wasn't a strong Likud leader because the fights uh, between all the people that wanted to take his, uh, his part. But I, I hope in God's will, you know, Israel will it's an interesting. It's an interesting question. Uh, superficially, one might say, oh, sure, if he were gone, it would be sweetness and light, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, Gidon Sar would come home, Lieberman would come home, uh, but you don't know who, uh, you know, if Sar says, okay, so now I should be the head of Likud, and he's denied that, maybe he doesn't come home. You know, maybe this is not so much just about Bibi as it is about where am I in all of this and how do I advance in all of this? So it's, it's not, I, I think it's not such a simplistic uh, question as, uh, okay, Bibi's gone, now it's all sweetness and light. I'm not sure that that would be the case. Here's another scenario. Uh, and I don't know if any time if anyone asked about this, but one that is being discussed is let's wave a wand and make Bibi the new president of Israel. Ruby Rivlin's term is over in July, and there will be a new president of Israel. Maybe uh, to break this Gordian knot, uh, Bibi becomes the president. Uh, and maybe as part of that, he works out, the, there's a deal. First of all, as president, he would have immunity for the 10 years, I think, is his term, uh, that he would be president. So uh, the court cases would, in effect, go away. And now uh, you have the opportunity to have the, uh, the landscape clear of his uh, being prime minister and, and the divisiveness that that seems to have created. Matan, do you have any take on that? Is that at all a realistic possibility or is that also wishful thinking? I think that the, the option just uh, now said, by, by the way, the first people who started to talk about it, are, uh, it, it, were, it started in the media, in my opinion, in, a, in the left-wing uh, media. And I think this um, idea when the left, when the anti bb camp uh, raised it up, I think I, it, it's a, a little bit hypocrisy, because if you are saying we don't des we don't deserve a, a prime minister who is a criminal or a potential criminal, so you will. But as so a we should have a president who's a criminal, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. The hypocrisy is amazing, and I think yes. it just shows show that um, it's it's. They want to take Netanyahu out of the game because his, you know, his shoulders are very strong. He's a stubborn guy, and he's a stubborn guy for Israel. Um, I don't look at the prime ministers that we had until now in the last few years, and I'm and I'm thinking about uh, Itzhak Rabin that wasn't a good prime minister, and I think about Ehud Barak that wasn't a good prime minister, and Itzhak Shamir that was okay but not very strong one, Ehud Olmert. Arik Sharon with the disengagement. Israel, in the last almost 40 years, didn't have a great, great prime minister. Uh, Netanyahu is a good, very good prime minister. Now, I can um, criticize a lot of Netanyahu. There are a lot of things in Interzul that we are doing that we don't see eye to eye with him and we criticize him. Uh, and we still do. And maybe some of them we will talk in, in later on, but basically he's a good prime minister. The left understand that he can win only, he believes that he can take control of Israel only if Netanyahu will go out, go, will vanish, will disappear. I still don't think they have a chance, but um, they want to take him out. So Matana, I just, so you said something interesting. You said that Whoever switches Netanyahu, they're going to hate as well. 
I think this is a quote attributed to Trump, and he said, they don't hate you because they hate me. Sorry, they don't hate, uh, they, yeah, they don't hate you because they hate me. They hate me because they hate you. Meaning, do you think that all this hate with, hatred towards Bibi, uh, putting, let's say, uh, Bennett and Gidon Sara aside, do you think all this hatred from the Israeli left-wing media is not because they really hate Bibi, it's just because they hate the nationalist camp in Israel? It's because they don't like right-wing, they want to push their left-wing uh, people to power? And it's not really about Bibi, it's just about the right and the left? Here, I think the... Um... Look, I, I, don't, I don't like the separation that a lot of people use between uh, Ashkenazic and Sephardic, okay? I think it's stupid, and I think also there is today, because there are so much uh, families that are mixed, I think it's, um, you know, there are uh, Sephardic people who behave in Ashkenazic way, and there are Ashkenazic people who, who behave more like uh, Sephardic, I mean, in the... In the um, in the reputation, yes, of, of, the, of the behavior. So, but it looks like the, there is like a hatred to, do, to Bibi supporters because they are like, they see them as the mob. They see They're the deplorables. They are the deplorables, just like the uh, Trump supporters in the United States were the deplorables. There's a, there is, a fair amount of that here, yeah. let's face it. We are the elitistic white people who knows everything, and you are the mob. You are, and, and by the way, by, by the way, why, I, I'm always very concerned about the future of Israel because I see those things also um, before in history, you know, when, when the small elite, um, you know, started to look at the, at, the, at the general public as the mob, people who just, believe in the Bible and believe in God that we don't see it and believe in stupid holidays instead of being, you know, um, embraced Hellenism and progressivism and all the gods and all the narratives. We had those problems before. Right. Um, We've seen so, the movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and those, this movie is very serious one. I think we need to take it very seriously. Um, Another thing, I think, if I want to jump for a second to a different angle, the problem, and I saw it in the chat, one of the people in the chat wrote it, the, our enemies, this, this is one of the problems, our enemies take this thing as an opportunity, okay? We are seeing as like how the Islamic movement in the Negev building more and more illegal houses because the police doesn't have the boss, okay? The ministers are weak, okay? And in Area C, we are seeing the European Union and the Palestinian Authority, they build more and more and more and more because the political situation in Israel is stuck, okay? So our enemies take control of the situation very, very much. All the illegal immigrants, they are, you know, the they feel very safe because there is no chance that now there will be a strong government who will um, try to solve their problem and maybe they turn their, them back home. So our enemies are getting, you know, they're working. They are not, they don't have a political problem now. And um, Well, Matan, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I'm building on what you said. So now at a time of all this political uncertainty, do you feel that, let's say, uh, NGOs, nonprofits like Intertsu, that we have more of a role to play, that we have less of a, a role to play? Do you think that it's more important now that no one really knows what's going on politically to step up? Or do you think now is the time to really step back and let the politicians handle it? No, I agree with you completely. I was, I was just wanted to mention, for example, Regavim, a Regavim organization that is an amazing uh, Zionist organization that fights a lot against illegal uh, buildings in Judea and Samaria and uh, the Negev. But uh, for your answer, I see also Intertsu like that. Because as we say uh, in also this discussion, norm, society norm is stronger than the government. The, and now there is really the responsibility today on the shoulders of the NGOs or on the grassroots movements are much more because, to, because when the ministers are weak and they don't even have the time to approach 
um, um, a lot of challenges because they are in, in a political limbo, then the NGOs, they are the ones who need to share light on the urgent stuff and, and, and force the ministers to work against this and that, no matter what. And also sometimes to go to court and to force the government to do this and that and to create public pressure on the right places. You know, even about Ram, even about Ram, about the Islamic movement, that again, every, Arabs in the Middle East, they are like saying, those Jews are crazy. They want to, they have one country, that's it, and they're going to, to make it depend on the Islamic uh, Muslim Brotherhood. What a joke. Here, and look, Moses was an unbelievable uh, leader, okay? But um, God told him, talk with the stone and create water. He did something very realistic. He took a, 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 you know, a, a, sto a, a stick and beat on the, on, on, on the rock, and like this water ca came, and God was very angry. This is the reason that Moses didn't go, go into the Israeli land, the promised land. Herzl, Herzl in, a, in a, the sixth Zionist Congress, he said, look, you know what? Maybe because of the problems now and the, program, and the programs, let's, let's go to Uganda. Even just for a while, let's go to Uganda. Sometimes leaders are think about practical solutions. And that's it, they sometimes, and what happened after the, the, the sixth uh, Congress of Herzl? This is the, this was the end of Herzl's career. In the sixth Congress, the idea of Uganda was still uh, ob abandoned. He said no to Uganda. And also uh, Herzl uh, still say, I will never forget Jerusalem. Sorry for uh, uh, suggesting Uganda, let's forget about it. But the people didn't forget. Herzl was over after it. Right. And uh, Eitan, your question is spot on, as they say. And I would echo what Matan is saying that this, look, I tell friends in America all the time Israel is a very strong society with a dysfunctional government. All right. It's dysfunctional even when things are normal. All right. And there is a role for NGOs. But now, today, Dafka, because we don't have government, the, the, the need for NGOs like Imtirtsu, like Regavim, like Ad Khan, groups that are standing up and, and holding the feet to the fire, as it were, and saying, you can't do that. You, you, that's just not acceptable. It's not acceptable behavior. This has become much, much more important. Our role as is even more heightened today because there is a vacuum and 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 we have to help fill that vacuum yes in two ways, education is uh, ideologic way and also to fight the bad guys because the political situation is stuck right so i want to take a we're sort of winding down but i want to take another question back to a portion of the chat I've been seeing a lot of people have been saying, hey, Bibi, he's on trial, he's guilty, he's not guilty. I wanted to ask Doug to maybe explain why there's so many people in Israel that don't have so much trust in the judicial system. They think the high court is stepping beyond its mandate. And what's, I think it's sort of an issue that people in Israel are very, very strong about. The right wing in Israel, the nationalist parties, they talk about it all the time, the override clause. But people abroad, this is not such a hot issue. Do you mind explaining yes. a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, we, we have a situation here that is very hard for many Americans in particular to understand because the separation of powers here is not as rigid or as clean as it is, say, in the United States. In the United States, the Supreme Court uh, hears something on the order of 2,000 cases a year. In Israel, the Supreme Court hears 22,000 cases a year. Many of them are cases of first instance. So the Supreme Court, what started in 1995 with Aaron uh, Barak's judicial revolution has grown to the point where you now have a Supreme Court where that, that has said, we don't really need to have standing. 
we don't really need to have uh, a basis in the law. We will, we will judge based on what we think is reasonable. And many people, ourselves included in, in tier two, and many, many on the right, say that the Supreme Court has become something of an uber legislature, something of an oligarchy here, and uh, has taken uh, tremendous liberties to, to review and strike down laws that, um, and to involve themselves in army protocols that, that would seem to go way, way, way beyond the traditional role of the judiciary in a Western democracy. Now, the prime minister is somewhat, you know, trying to play into that. He also realizes that he, he uh, is somewhat constrained because he's being tried by those very same people. But, but this is not a BB issue. This is not about if there were no BB, if there were no cases, this problem still exists with great, uh, unfortunately, with, with great uh, prevalence. And it is one that we think is crying out for, for remediation. Uh, who chooses the judges? You know, in the United States, how does the Supreme Court judge get chosen? The president nominates and the Supreme, and the, the Senate uh, approves. In Israel, there is a committee, and a lot of the choice, choosing of justices is done by justices themselves or by uh, bar committee members who wish they want to be judges. Uh, they, they would become judges, so they have a vested interest in how this goes down. It's a very closed system. It needs to change, and uh, it's a big problem. Matan, do you want to add it? Anything no, to that? I think, hmm? No, I think I, I agree with that. Great. I want to go to a question from David for, from Toronto. Uh, this is a little different. He basically asks you guys, what are you optimistic about from these elections? What are you optimistic about? What does it show? Anything? Do we have to look forward to anything? First of all, this is a great country. And it we have a lot to look forward here. Like I said earlier, it's, it's an, an amazing society with a dysfunctional government. Um, what people here, look at how we've managed to come out of the virus situation. Amazing. I was at a Shabbat dinner the other night with a doctor from the United States who made Aliyah. He's now an oncologist at Hadassah Hospital. He said, I still practice in America. You cannot believe the difference between how the virus was handled here in Israel and how it was handled in America. Is it light years different? We have a lot to look forward to in this country. I look at, at the people, the young people who work at MTIR2, and I say, wow, we're in great hands. There's a lot here to look forward to, uh, irrespective of the elections. I don't know that the elections made me optimistic about anything except that people were willing to go back to the polls again, which, you know, says something about civic involvement. But I have great, great optimism about our society in general. I, when someone is, you say, you said some very nice things, Doug, and after something like this, it's hard to say something else. But um, although I, uh, I appreciate what you said and ag agree with this, um, I'm very disappointed out of our leaders, all of them. I think Israeli society it deserves to have much, much better politicians. And uh, you know, in the army we learned that um, when you are in a battleground and people are shooting against you, the, the worst thing to do is to start crying and start to wiping, you know, eh, how did we get to this uh, street, this <laughs> corner? Because when um, someone is shooting on us, you need to be cold, realistic, and try to think how to go out of this corner. Um, so now I think, also the Imtirzu and the rest of the 
organizations, I think now we need to, you know, cooperate with reality and, and you know, make, uh, help the Israeli society to go, to, to go through this um, storm, this um, challenge. But after it, in God's will, after it, when the, the political situation will be more stable, I think um, we need to be very angry and criticize a lot and to see what to do with our politicians because this is not the way. Our, the politicians of Israel cannot be so childish. I'm very disappointed out of them. I have a lot of friends, personal friends, and Imtirzu has a lot of friends in a lot of parties, but, and I'm, I think I'm very disappointed with a lot of them. I just, in, in uh, Motzei Shabbat, I talked, ah, it was last, yes, last night. Uh, I talked with one um, about maybe he needs to um, decide differently. And he said, no, I will never decide differently. This is what, but this is childish. So for now, no, no crying, but later on, we will need to do something about them. Okay, great. I think I'm going to go to one last question. It's sort of tying everything together. It's an interesting question from Goldie. Uh, she asked, Doug, NGOs in Israel are important. We've talked about Intertu's role and how important it is now. And uh, I just want to I just remember now there was something very interesting I just want to share with you guys that uh, there was actually an Israel Prize, which is one of Israel's most prestigious awards. It was supposed to be awarded to a pro BDS professor. And last week we exposed that this professor really is uh, in favor of BDS. And we work with the education minister and basically he's not going to receive this Israel Prize this year. So Goldie asked that you guys do important work and NGOs in Israel are important. How important are like, NGOs in the diaspora? Or maybe to, to switch around the question, what could they do if they could do anything in terms of this election? I mean, is there anything that you think that they could do, they could uh, support any party to help them, push them in the right direction, to help them get together and make up, I guess? Um, I, think, I think what Matan said is very relevant here in terms of, um, people should rise above petty considerations, personal considerations, see a bigger picture, say that there are important things at stake here, including getting down to the business of, of having a government. Uh, I, I had my hair cut, you know, this is the classic situation where you get great wisdom of the world from your barber, right? The other day, and he said, I'm really annoyed that my government isn't working for me. These guys are being paid and they're not working, they're not doing anything. Where are they? What are, what's that about? And, and there's a lot of truth to that. So I think that, 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 that our friends in the diaspora should be uh, lobbying to have uh, some unity here, to have some you know, ideological consistency here and say, let's put aside the, uh, the personal considerations. Let's get down to the business of forming and running a government. I think that I also agree with that. The, the, the diasporian, the, 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 the Zionist organizations in, in the diaspora are, first of all, they're very important because they are, they are a, bri a bridge of Israel and they defend Israel. And, but also I think now, they, uh, maybe they don't need to go to deep in the political, uh, tactics like, like we in Imtirzu sometimes do because they are seeing things from far away, but and they need to use this perspective. I think they, as Doug said, they need to demand that our politicians to be more matured, to be more serious, to say, you are embarrassing us, what's going on? You are, you are a light of the nation, a light to the nations, you're doing an incredible stuff, you, you beat the COVID-19, for now, until the next uh, mutation. Um, so behave as, as uh, mature people. I think this is something that all the Zionist leaders of any, uh, all, the parties, all the parties need to hear, need to hear. The Iranians, they really don't care who will be the prime minister. They hate us all, you know. Okay, great. All right, I think we're pretty much winding down. 
Before I give the floor over to Matan and Doug to go ahead and share some parting words, I just want to put this on the screen quickly. This is our contact information, how to get in touch with us. And uh, I also would be remiss if I didn't mention that, you know, people sometimes don't realize, but Interzoo is a nonprofit organization. And many people do uh, support us who are here. Thank you so much. But uh, really, in order to continue the work that we do, we uh, rely on donations from dedicated Zionists like uh, the people here. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and put in the chat the, the link to our website, a donation. Whoever wants to give a gift, that would be very, very obviously appreciated. And whoever wants to follow us on social media, that would be great. Anything really just to help, to help us get the word out and uh, sign up for our newsletter. You can see all the amazing stuff that we're doing. And also in, like I mentioned in the beginning, in three weeks, we plan on uh, doing another one of these things. And I also want to send everybody at the end an email with some feedback to let us know if there's anything specific you guys want to hear about uh, for next time. So thank you very much. And I'm just going to hand the floor right now to Matan and Doug to say bye. The last thing I want to say that is that uh, we talked about general stuff and about politi politics and politics situation. But um, let's not forget that even now, uh, Imtirtsu is still a grassroots organization. Our people are on the ground. So even, even today, we did, uh, our activists did a very nice, very impressive uh, operation of planting trees uh, in Gush Etzion. Um, that was very nice. Our, our branches, almost every night, it's unbelievable, doing operations of giving sweets to soldiers in Judea and Samaria. And uh, in Gaza border. Um, so this is really amazing, the stuff that our activists are doing uh, on the ground all the time. In the Holocaust, they, uh, they went, our activists went to Metzada Hill um, and did a ceremony, a memorial ceremony of the Holocaust in Metzada in, um, to talk about those two things. So Im Tirzu is from the one side, they're involved in politic, politicians and, and you know, things that are maybe fluid, but from the other side, there is a very strong level of beautiful, unbelievable people, activists, who are doing a lot of uh, impressive uh, work on the ground. And um, let's not forget them. Let's, let's not forget it also. You know, uh, Imtir 2 has been doing what it's, doing since 2007. And from a standing start, uh, we've grown to have 20 branches on different campuses throughout the country. In any given year, six to 7,000 volunteer activists participate in one or more of our activities. And what we have grown to become is really uh, the Zionist watchdog of Israel. And what Matan just talked about is, it, is very sweet. It's not earth shattering, okay? It's not earth shattering to hand treats to a soldier. It's not earth shattering to uh, visit an elderly Holocaust survivor. But this is walking, this is talking the Zionist talk and walking the Zionist walk. It is putting meat on the bones of what does it mean to live in a Jewish society? What does it mean to live in a society where Jews feel responsible for one another. And, and what I'm most proud of about Imtir Tzu is that these little things become important to us. It becomes important to us to find that this professor at the Weizmann Institute, who I'm sure is a brilliant professor, but he's, he's signing petitions against his own colleagues at Ariel University that they should be boycotted. This is not someone who should be getting the Israel Prize. And we raised this, and guess what? The education ministry said, you know, you're right, you're right. Uh, these are the things that need to be happening in our society. And again, especially when a government is AWOL, our position becomes that much more important and necessary. So I I urge you, as someone who is, has been a donor to Imtir Tzu since its earliest days, I urge my fellow friends out there to, uh, to support us as well. What we do, we do on a shoestring, and, uh, and it's all going to support Am Yisrael. So thank you for today. We hope to do this on a regular basis, 
and we look forward to uh, your feedback and how we can make this uh, even more effective for next time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aidan, for uh, moderating. And Doug, see you in the Thanks next you very much. event, right, in uh, the San Remo event. Right. That Aidan yes. will send it also. Yes, yes, we'll be having a conference, uh, a gathering about the San Remo, the 100th anniversary of the San Remo conference in two weeks from today. Uh, Eitan will send you a, a flyer for that, and uh, you certainly welcome to join us for that as well. Great. Uh, Have a great week, and uh, we'll be in touch. Feel free to get in touch with us. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you.